<laughs> okay, well, thanks for joining us today, uh, Lindsay. Can you just kind of get us started with uh, a little bit of a rundown on, on the last term, kind of highs and lows and in between? Yes, yes. Well, I'll, first, I just want to say thanks for um, having a conversation with me this morning and, you know, grateful that you do the work that you do in our community. Um, and for those of you who are tuning in online, hello. <laughs> Glad mm -hmm. to always get my perspectives and, and voice out there and, uh, you know, talk about what you're concerned with as well. So very glad to be on this. Um, the last session was, you know, fast and furious. Obviously, uh, the state of Iowa has a lot of challenges that we're facing. We're facing workforce crisis, um, funding our public schools and teacher shortage crisis. We're facing um, mental health care shortages, child care so shortages. Um, a number of issues our um, state is facing. And so, it was an, an attempt to address all of those. I would say that the high level assessment of um, what happened over the session, last session, was that we simply put band-aids over uh, gaping wounds. Um, major challenges that are uh, being addressed uh, with very minimal solutions. And so I think that my critique is really of the majority party, the GOP Republican Party, which is a trifecta, have um, the complete and total power to make decisions to allocate resources in our state and my assessment of the last session was that it was a failure in actually addressing the needs of the state of iowa can can you drill down on that a little bit and talk about some of the specific areas where that brought the biggest concerns for you sure well so i will uh when i'm having conversations with constituents on doors what I am hearing directly from them is that the major challenges that they face are not resolved. So this past week, I was at the door of a, uh, a grandmother and a mom living together in the same household with young kids who couldn't afford diapers. So we're seeing that um, the tax cuts that were put through in the last session were directed to wealthy people and corporations. And that those who are middle income or low income are actually not going to feel any benefit um, until five years from now, four years from now. And um, that is going to be minimal at best, maybe $55 a month. Now, that is important money, and we want to see that. But um, when the wealthiest person is making, you know, reaping $64,000 plus dollars, um, for their tax benefits, you can see that it's just a tax cut that is directed to the wealthy. So that's one example of um, you know a misallocation of our taxpayer dollars by the Republican Party. Um, when I talk to constituents, I ask them, "Is it any easier for you to find childcare? Is it less expensive?" And the resounding answer is no. It is not easier to find childcare. It is not less expensive. Again, Band-Aid solutions put on by the Republican Party are actually not solving any of the real problems in front of us. I'd say mental health care is another one. I ask constituents, are you able to get the care that you need? And resoundingly, the answer is no that wait lists are still long, that it's difficult to find uh, people to serve their unique needs. Another one is workforce. Um, again, that is an issue that when I talk to small businesses and large businesses, they say over and over and over again that workforce is their first and foremost challenge in this time. And so our ability to recruit and to retain talent in this state um, is not uh, being solved as well. So, and then of course, we've got not enough housing for our workforce. We have a workforce housing shortage as well. And so again, is it is it easier? Is it less expensive? Are you able to find the kind of home that um, your family needs? Um, and then of course, I would say the data shows us that there is rural population drain. Um, people living in the rural parts of our state are um, moving to the cities. We're seeing that our rural schools, we've had rural school closures. We have had rural hospital closures. And so we are having deep struggles in the rural part of our state. And 
all of us know that, you know, when one part of our state struggles, we all struggle, right? We need strong rural Iowa. We need strong cities in order for us to really make sure that everybody is thriving. So, so anticipating that, that, that uh, the leadership might not change, the majorities might not change. Um, yeah. What, what, does going back for, for another term, uh, what can you hope to accomplish uh, given some of those challenges? How, how do you try to be effective in that in none of those conditions? Well, I'm a redhead, Amy, so I am persistent. Um, I, part, of, part of why um, I am deeply compelled to go back for another term is because of the work is not done. And I, have found that doing this work is some of the most profound work you can do. I have been invited into people's lives and their challenges that they're facing in a way that not everyone gets to be. I get to stand on their porch and um, meet their children and listen to their concerns and what keeps them up at night. And every time I go to the Capitol and I lift up the microphone to give a floor on the speech, it's with those stories in mind. And, you know, I am passionate about making sure that we are making decisions based on our constituents, not based on DC politics. That's really important. And we have seen over the last number of years that DC politics has trickled into our state in a way that I don't believe is um, helpful for us actually solving the problems that, that are in front of us. And so really wanting to get back to um, constituents and solving their particular needs. I work on doing this to answer your question more specifically by um I, I work really hard to form relationships across the aisle so i was actually co-founded the first bicameral uh bipartisan caucus in iowa's history i did that my first year in the legislature um amy i have since aged out of that caucus it was <laughs> Um, directed at those legislators who were 40 years and younger. Um, and so I'm happy to say that um, I got to pass it along to other very capable um, Democrats and Republicans to work across the aisle to solve some of um, the major issues that Iowa faces. But that doesn't mean that I'm not doing the work. I have worked, as you've seen and as, as you've reported, on major issues facing our community in particular in the mobile home uh, parks. And I have done that in a bipartisan way. I've worked with Republicans across the aisle to make sure that they have better protections. And again, I will use the same critique. <laughs> um, the challenges that our mobile home residents are facing are significant. And uh, the solution that we um, put forward this year was simply a Band-Aid on that. And so my critique stands with that, even though there was some incremental change and some um, very small steps forward in protecting those residents, I'd say it did not solve the bulk of their problem. So, um, but you know, again, Amy, I am persistent. And as long as Dubuqueers give me a microphone at the Capitol, <laughs> I will be telling their stories and fighting for their causes and um, doing it in a way where I am able to make some incremental changes um, and, you know, push for the big ones. Tell us a little bit more about the, uh, about the mobile home park issue and kind of what would be your, your priorities, uh, your goals for, for trying to strengthen that, that legislation and what are the odds of, of being able to get that accomplished? Sure. So um, we've been at this for four years. And uh, we have seen that, you know, a number of years ago, these large private equity firms, big corporations with very predatory business practices coming in, buying up mobile home parks uh, in Dubuque and across the state, and then raising their rent exponentially and price gouging them out of their homes. Now, people, there is a misconception about the word mobile home. I like to use manufactured housing communities because um, the use of mobile actually um, gives people the sense that it's really easy to pick up your home and move to another location. One, there are not locations um, to move to um, that are not also experiencing incredible rent hikes. And it costs about five to $10,000 to move a mobile home. And often, once they are sitting on property for a long period of time, 
they are not in the kind of shape where they, it's even possible to move them. We've also had parks that have intentionally put in their policies to remove the hitch that would make it possible for someone to pick up their home and move. They would have to then re-weld a hitch onto their home in order to move it. So this whole notion of mobile um, is misleading. These residents um, are very much so trapped in their communities at the whims of these large corporations that have predatory practices and are out to turn a profit for themselves and their shareholders. It is truly the wealthiest people in our country exploiting some of the poorest people in our country. I've had families tell me story after story of some of the costs. Um, you know, one woman who had to sell her car, uh, her only form of transportation to work in order to make rent. Um, I know I tell the story often of the gentleman who had to make the choice between paying for his insulin medication um, in, or his, his house. So he had the choice of, do I keep my home or do I keep my foot? These are impossible choices um, and, and they don't have to be. We have good policy that could actually hold these companies accountable. So things like rent justification, like you cannot exponentially um, raise rent in order uh, to turn a profit. Um, and so you can actually put um, a cap on that to say, hey, you can't raise above 10, 13, 15% in any given year unless you have a business reason, a justification for doing that. Like we need to offset some cost of, you know, paving the ground or water infrastructure. So there's policies there um, that are, would really help resolve this situation. But again, there has to be the political will from the majority party in order for us to actually solve these major problems. And I think that part of, at the end of the day, it takes resources and political will. And I think that, um, you know, that is not there when it comes to GOP leadership. Following up on that, Lindsay. Um, so, I mean, what do you say to the folks who just say this is this is the free market and government shouldn't be involved in you know uh, these kind of deciding how much you rent property you own um for yes i kind of i just my computer just lost you there for a second i'm back can you still see me yeah okay maybe you guys just disappeared for a second i really appreciate that question dustin um i really believe that um you know, companies should have the right to turn a reasonable profit. And so in this circumstance, we certainly want businesses to come in to Iowa and we want to be friendly with our businesses and we want them to be able to, to turn a reasonable profit. This is not a reasonable profit. These are companies that are price gouging with a predatory business model. You know, they're raising rents 50, 60, you know, in one part of the state, 70% increases. And these are truly some of the, you know, financially, um, their residents who live in mobile home parks have chosen that as the financially responsible decision as a way to get a home. It's a, it's a low income option for a home. And so we want to make sure that our mobile home communities are protected as a part of the housing solution. Um, because if we lose that, we're going to be even in a more desperate spot. So certainly I think that, um, you know, businesses have the right to, to turn a reasonable profit. This is not that. I know that education has always been a big priority for you. And it just seems like, um, there's a pretty big divide on whether or not we can fund, uh, you know, provide more funding for education or whether, you know, the status quo is is what it has to be. So tell us a little bit about where where you, you know, what you think should change there and, and whether there's any room for movement on, on that issue. Uh, so certainly I think that um, I have been a very loud champion of public schools and funding for our public schools. One of the things that we've seen over the last 10 years is a chronic underfunding of our public schools, not even funding in a way that keeps up with the rate of inflation. And let's talk about that as it, as it relates to Dubuque in particular. So if you can't keep up with the rate of inflation, that is essentially you know, a cut to our schools. And then on top of that, we've seen with COVID and other realities, 
Um, we do have parts of our school district that um, have a lot of transient families coming in and out. And so when you have kids moving from school to school and you don't, you, you know, lose a portion of that funding, well, part of what happens is um, when you have that kind of loss, you don't get to spread the, you know, cost out. You can't necessarily close a whole school and cut a whole teaching staff in order to compensate for, you know, that several kids moving. And so that per pupil funding, um, you still have to fund the schools, you still have to fund the infrastructure, you still have to fund the teacher's salaries, um, even though those per pupil funding losses um, happen. So part of what the challenge is, is when we, you know, don't keep up with the rate of inflation, it is in fact a cut and the schools have to scramble. We've seen them um, be squeezed with resources over time. And, you know, how many teachers are putting up GoFundMe pages on Facebook in order to afford classroom supplies? I mean, my kids have to do cookie dough fundraisers and walkathons and, um, you know, Christmas wrapping paper uh, fundraisers in order to make sure that they have the funding that they need. So we have made our teachers into, you know, fundraisers and having to, uh, instead of focusing on our kids in the classroom. So funding is really important. When the governor put forward proposals for um, a voucher system, so to move some of those tax dollars um, over to the private schools, you know, what happens there is that we see major losses, um, not just in our school district, like in Duty Community School District, but we see major losses in rural parts of the state that don't have private schools near them or accessible for their kids. And so it's just a huge net loss um, as well. I would also add, Amy as another um, point that I really think is really important that the public knows is that our private schools and our public schools do not play by the same set of rules. So if you look at um, private schools across the state, many of them boast of a 100% graduation rate. And you start to dig a little bit deeper, like why is that? And it is because they um, are not required by law to make sure that every child um, gets through graduation. Um, and so often what happens is if a, a student falls behind, if a student has uh, intellectual disabilities, if a student has behavior challenges, they are often kicked out of that private school system. And then the public school system is required by law to help pick up that student and get them across that finish line. And so when you have um, funding going to the private schools um, at the expense of the public schools, and they don't play by the same set of rules, that causes a lot of um, equity challenges. And so, you know, the fear is, is that when private schools are picking and choosing who they want to be in their classrooms or their schools, um, you know, then, then the kids who have struggles or, you know, intellectual disabilities or learning disabilities, um, they, they lose out. And I think the fear for me is, is seeing that that is an, you know, unjust system for our kids. And we all know that our public schools are there to give our kids their best chance at life. They're the great equalizer. And so if we fund our public schools adequately, then I would be willing to consider also additionally funding our private schools as well. But until they play by the same set of rules and until our public schools are funded, then, um, you know, for me, that is an issue that um, is only going to harm our kids. 90% of our kids are in public schools. So uh, we want to make sure that they have those resources. And I guess, I mean, we know that the the school choice measure was, was a, a priority for the governor. And so I think we can anticipate that uh, coming back around and um, do you anticipate there would be any more, um, any more enthusiasm for it this time? Or, I mean, I'm sure it'd, it'll be another big, big fight. It's yes. So I'll give you some, you know, information about kind of what we saw happen at the state legislature. When you crunch the actual financial numbers, it makes no sense to, um, have funding allocated in this way. One, because it will harm rural public schools, um, too, because of the equity piece. Um, and so we saw a handful of Republicans who agreed with Democrats on that issue and said, okay, we will not vote to support it. 
And so all session long, there was lots of um, arm twisting by the Republican leadership to convince those members to support that legislation. And those Republicans stayed strong. And that is why we saw that they that that did not move forward. Now, we also saw that the governor took that very personally. And so what she did was played in a number of Republican primaries. Um, and she won a number of Republican primaries. And so what happened is she went into districts, she endorsed the primary opponents of sitting Republican incumbents. She financed, um, you know, radio ads or calls or text banks, you know, to those opponents. And all of that is public record, um, you know, because of the campaign finance. And so um, she got really vicious. And what we're seeing is the Republican Party turning in on itself and, um, you know, attacking itself. And uh, that is a strong indication for the public that it is time for a leadership change. And uh, I do anticipate that um, she did win some of those districts. And so now we have some other school voucher Republicans who are going to push and support that. But I also think that this election cycle will have some good surprises for Democrats. And I think that um, based on the candidates that we're putting up uh, across the state of Iowa, um, with a vision and a heart for public education, I think that we will um, hopefully be able to beat back school vouchers once again in the legislature and you know keep our rural schools strong and our community and neighborhood schools strong. Yeah, thanks. So a little political <laughs> inside information for you all. Um, Lindsay, so early on, you're talking about talking to, to people and, and asking them things like, you know, regarding mental health care and workforce and, you know, the Republicans are in control. So these issues are kind of all on them. But I guess my question is, how would, if the Democrats had power, uh, yeah. how would you go about solving something like the workforce shortage. I mean, what is the solution yeah. there? Yep. So um, we're talking a lot about, so Democrats put out a, you know, a large platform statement that talked about lowering the cost for Iowans um, as we face, you know, inflation rates. So a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, making sure that our tax breaks are directed specifically at the middle class, lower income Iowans, as opposed to what we have now, which is directed at wealthy, and corporations. Um, we are also, you know, working on what does it look like for us to, you know, recruit and retain talent in our state. In order to do that, in order to keep families here, we have to have affordable and accessible childcare. We have to have more open slots. We have to have more incentives for um, businesses to make sure that their their workforce has what they need. Um, and there's a number of policy positions that um, we've taken over the last years to, to address that. We see the benefits cliff, um, you know, is still an issue, although we did some incremental work on that, it was not enough. So alleviating, um, you know, some of the, you know, creating more tax benefits for families who have dependents, um, housing, of course. So you want to recruit and retain people. Um, they need to be able to have a, a house to come to, childcare to put their child in, a good job that has good wages. Raising the minimum wage is another important piece of that. Providing collective bargaining rights for um, our working families is another piece of that. And so there's a lot of ways in which we can actually address the challenge. Um, you know, quality of life, Dustin, that's another huge one. I mean, we in, in Dubuque are so blessed with the Mississippi um, and we are blessed with um, a, a council that is thinking about um, how do we make that more accessible, the, the river walk, water trails, um, you know, and so taking, taking state funding and dollars and really putting it to work when it comes to quality of life also means environmental protection. And so um, we need to make sure that our, our kids have parks and playgrounds and clean water and, um, you know, making sure that we have all of that beautiful quality of life that Iowa naturally offers, but we need to protect. Kind of, kind of in the, oh, Dustin, were you going to say something? 
uh, kind of in the same vein, I think you also talked about kind of the the rural the issue of you know rural areas where we've got fewer and fewer people. People are moving to bigger cities. I mean, that sort of is a trend you see everywhere. So, I mean, from a legislative perspective, you know, what does it look like to address that, or um, you know, if you know if, if both in the kind of the current uh, situation in the legislature as well as kind of from the Democrats perspective, you know, what does it look like to address that? Yeah, I think um, some of that alley would be around um, when you you think about brain drain or population drain, um, young talent moving to cities. I think we have to ask ourselves the question of what does it look like for us to provide job opportunities and high quality of life for families in rural Iowa? And I think that that means how do we get creative in you know, recruiting new businesses into our state. Um, I have to say that Utah, interestingly, I mean, they have gorgeous, um, you know, landscape and terrain as well. And they recruit a lot of startup companies. They've been very intentional about startup company recruitment into their state. And, um, you know, I think we can capitalize on um, some of the fact that there are very dense parts of our country and we have a gorgeous state and we have a population of people who are both down to earth and um, deeply thoughtful, wonderful people. And um, it is a family friendly place to live. And so I think we can actually be intentional in our recruitment of, um, you know, startup companies and companies who want to try to, to make it. But I also think that that we need to be intentional about saying, OK, if if a hospital or a pharmacy closes in rural Iowa, people are not going to, to move there. If we have childcare workforce problems because we are completely underpaying our childcare staff, no childcare, you know, person can make it on 26,000 a year, which is, you know, the average, you know, payment of someone who is doing childcare as work. So there are ways in which we need to be very intentional about making sure that people have healthcare access in rural Iowa, making sure they have childcare, that we've fully funded the public schools. I mean, we've been number one in our public schools in the past. And, you know, that is a way to recruit and retain talent. I mean, imagine if you were a young family considering moving to our state and we were top in education, and that meant your kid's going to get a world-class education and incredible opportunities. Yeah, of course they're going to move here and, you know, try us out. So there are some things that we can really push in order to make rural Iowa stronger, but we're not seeing that at the state level because one, it takes political will and it takes resources. And um, right now, the Iowa GOP is more interested in, in hoarding surplus dollars than investing your, by the way, those are your taxpayer dollars. They are more interested in hoarding surplus dollars for a political talking point than they are investing in the infrastructure in our state that would actually help solve these problems. When when you mentioned the the child care um, worker shortage, that's something that that we hear a, a lot about every time we have um, a story about you know when some state funding comes through or or some a company works on you know opening a new daycare. Um, or there's funding to expand a daycare. Uh, we get calls from existing daycares that say, it, it's not that that we need more daycares. We need, you know, we could take more kids if we had more workers, but we don't. Yeah. Um, you know, from, from the daycare at Mercy Hospital to, you know, Steeple Square, we, you know, large and small, we hear, we hear that. So is there any any plans in the works? Is there is there legislation or what could incentivize uh, you know that that field to to try to increase the number of workers? Like you say, the you know, increase the wages, I guess, um, would be the start. Is there a state uh, uh, initiative that could work on that? I certainly think that um, Democrats have put forward legislation around um, increasing the wages for um, child care workers, increasing um, reimbursement rates, opening up more child care assistance slots. And I think that part of the challenge is if you are not, if you're not making it financially, you know, if you're having to work two jobs, then in order to make ends meet at 26000 a year, then um, 
you know, there's just no way to retain that. People are going to choose to work at Dunkin' Donuts before they're going to choose to work to care for our kids. And I can tell you as a mom, when our family moved to Dubuque, um, because we, I like to point this out, we are Iowa transplants. Um, our family came for a job opportunity for my husband. And I think that's an important point. Um, and we came because we saw that the city was investing in itself. We went down to, you know, the Washington neighborhood, um, to the Millwork district. Um, and we knew that, that this was a place that said, we're not giving up. We're not going to not just give up. We're going to grow and we're going to provide the best kind of life for you and your family possible. And I think that is largely due to a very, um, intentional city council. And so I really applaud their efforts in that regard. Um, and we need to see that. We need to match that kind of enthusiasm on a state level, especially in rural Iowa. But we came because of that. And, um, you know, in order to, um, you know, keep our transplants, we need to provide those opportunities. And as a mom, we sat on a, I sat on a wait list with one of my child for one year. So I was unable to work for one year. There are moms who need and want to work out there who just simply can't um, find a place, um, a safe place for their child to receive care. And so we need to continue to invest in um, in home daycares and work alongside um, families who want to maybe create that as a business opportunity for their family. Um, child Care Resources and Referral is an incredible group that does that kind of work. Um, you know, and how do we get resources to those families, um, especially when we have, you know, second and third shift and we're trying to address unique hours of the workforce. That's an important way of solving it. So there's a lot of different strategies that we could, you know, go after this particular issue. But what it takes is a political party who's willing to have hard conversations, willing to acknowledge that it's a problem and then willing to put resources behind it and have the political will to do that. And that is not what we're seeing with Iowa Republicans in the state house. And that's why you know, I will continue to be persistent and loud for our families when it comes to making sure that, that we actually solve the challenges in front of us. You know, every time we, um... We, we talk as we talk with politicians and of course we hear a lot about the devices divisiveness and partisanship um, behaviors and we we also hear well you know a lot of the work we do most of the work we do is is done in a bipartisan fashion mm -hmm. um, and you know it's you the media who wants to talk about the the fights. And I mean, there's a there's a little bit of truth to that. I mean, the the you know an issue that to, to you know that there's some controversy around is is more newsworthy than things that sail right through. But I mean, t tell us a, about that from your perspective. I mean, is is what is this ninety percent of the things that are that are you know everyone agrees on and that's work you get done. I, that is the most frustrating talking point for me as someone in the minority party, because um, there is that 80% or 90%, it gets, it gets larger every year from, from my colleagues across the aisle. Um, those are challenges that everyone can agree upon. They are, you know, or they're issues that everyone can agree upon and they are not any kind of, um, legislation that's solving some of the most pressing issues that our state is facing. Mm -hmm. The pressing issues when it comes to childcare, healthcare, workforce, housing, mental health care access, school funding, like some of those very significant challenges. Um, it is uh, not only is there um, partisan politics at play in those issues? But there's a very intentional shutting uh, the minority party out of those conversations. We are not invited into them. We are not, um, even if we insert ourselves into them, <laughs> you know, which we do. I will have to say that again, I'm a redhead, so I'm persistent. I will go sit with a Republican colleague on the floor of the House and, you know, share what my constituents are telling me and why this is a half hearted 
solution, why this is a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. And so I'll continue doing that. But it is um, the real issues that our state is facing. It is deeply polarized and, you know, partisan politics are deeply at play. I, you know, Amy, I got into this as a chaplain. You know, I spent my career as a chaplain on college campuses and I'm an ordained Presbyterian minister who's been trained in nonviolent communication strategies and restorative justice. And, you know, and so I do my best to um, use those, you know, strategies to relate to my colleagues. Um, I try not to politicize and polarize things too much, but um, we're at all. But I do believe in we need to name reality. We're at the point in our state where we just need to name what's really going on, which is, again, we've lost ground in public schools. We've lost, um, we have major workforce issues. We have a major housing crisis. We have healthcare issues um, that need to be addressed, including mental health. Like those, we have to name that reality. I believe that our state is careening in a direction that is um, not going to solve them, but exacerbate those problems. And unless we have everybody together, all the representatives at the table, solving problems and challenging one another, we are just going to further, you know, polarize and divide. So I, I will work really hard at continuing to, you know, do the bipartisan work and reach across the aisle and, you know, and I have found a cohort of uh, Republican colleagues across the aisle who will who will work with me. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I do. I, I just focus on, um, you know, reaching out to them and, and seeing what we can do. Is there particular legislation that, that you could point to where you were able to work across the aisle with somebody? Obviously, we talked about the, the mobile home, yeah, yeah. Uh, manufactured home measure, um, but is there other things yeah. you could point to? Sure. I um, I would have to say that um, every year I've been in the legislature, uh, capping the cost of insulin has been at the table and a part of the conversation. And that is because of persistent, I will work with anyone who will talk to me or hear me out on that particular issue. I've worked on um, you know, engaging activists around that issue to, to bring them to the Capitol to make their voice heard. So um, you know, capping the cost of prescription drugs. I am very excited. I'm, I'm very sad that our state hasn't been able to cross the finish line on that, but I am very excited that the Biden administration was able to cap the cost of insulin um, for those who are on Medicare. That is a huge step forward in making sure that, um, you know, people on life-saving medication have what they need. And so I, I feel very grateful for that. Um, where we didn't cross the finish line, at least we can see that on a federal level. And I will continue to, you know, push that. That's one example. Um, the manufactured housing um, issues are another example. Um, I've worked very closely for four years with two Republican legislators in particular, um, you know, that meant, that has meant I've been on the phone with them I, during off session. I've texted them. I have sent emails, news stories, you know, other kinds of interactions as a way to say, hey, <laughs> we agree that something needs to be changed. And we certainly don't agree on, on what, you know, the actual solution is. Um, but we're at least engaging each other in a conversation. So, and I think that that is because I am willing to work with anyone who wants to work on an issue. And I think I have um, a decent amount of, of respect at the Capitol. I've you know, built some, I think, really positive relationships there. Uh, I, I don't want to end this without, without addressing the uh, abortion issue. Can you tell us uh, what you hear, what you're hearing from constituents and what you think uh, you will be likely to see coming up in the legislative session. Sure, it's always difficult to predict exactly what will happen behind closed doors in the majority party, but certainly have deep concerns about an all out abortion ban. And um, Iowans are not with the majority party on this particular issue. I think when you actually talk to constituents at their doors, um, Asking a 13 year old child to, you know, to take a who has been raped or has, you know, experienced incest, asking a 13 year old girl to carry a child to term is just too much. That is why these kinds of conversations and decisions need to be made within the family context, 
within, you know, the medical conversation within faith communities. And I say that as um, a person who is an ordained pastor. Um, I am deeply um, committed to, you know, a consistent life ethic, if you will, and giving every kid their best chance at life. But we see that um, when women are put in a corner, um, that they are going to make a decision um, about their reproductive health care, whether it's legal or not. And so we want to make sure that we instead have resources for women to um, to carry their, their children. That means a paid family leave policy. We can do that as a state. You know, that means great child care. That means addressing maternal death rates. There are so many policy pieces that we could put forward over the counter birth control pills. There's just so many solutions that we could put forward to address this challenge. Um, and so I certainly, you know, will continue to champion those policy ideas throughout the community. Um, but we also have to give women um, the opportunity to choose when they start a family. And I, you know, believe that and trust that women are morally capable of making that decision and families are morally capable of making that decision. And I say that as a person of faith. Any, any other questions for Lindsay here as we wrap up? I don't think so. Covered a lot of ground. I would, Amy, can I offer one other policy piece that I think um, Iowa is in the midst of talking about that the legislature is not listening to? Sure. Um, Thank you. It's legalizing uh, adult use recreational marijuana. Um, we're seeing that Iowans um, want that product to be regulated and safe. And it is time to stop giving our tax dollars away to Illinois and Wisconsin um, and Iowa catching up with some very safe um, policy around adult use marijuana. And there's just no, no, uh, interest in that in among the Iowa Republicans? Um, at this point, no interest in that. We've heard that definitively from the governor and uh, a number of, of Republican legislators. Of course, the composition, Amy, the composition may change. And so that may be um, mm -hmm. something to, to bring up again. Um, I have been at work with a number of lawyers on actually creating a system to legalize recreational adult use of marijuana. Um, we right now have a very large 47 page bill <laughs> But we have worked on with think tanks, lawyers, um, policy analysts, researchers. We've taken um, the states, uh, some of the best things that other states have done and, and drafted it into the bill. I would get into the weeds with you all, no pun intended there. Um, but, you know, it's it's not quite ready for prime time. So, uh, you know, certainly. But, you know, this is the kind of work that I am doing is actually creating policy and structures um, that we can put into place. Um, when, when Democrats have control in the, in the house, um, and in the Senate and, and in the governor's mansion. So there is some exciting policy pieces that Democrats are ready to go with, um, when our constituents put us there. So I, I hope that, um, you know, I will get a ringing endorsement from constituents in our community that like I have had in the last two election cycles. Um, it is a deep honor to do this work. Well, we appreciate your time. Thanks for, for meeting with us and good luck for the rest of the, the campaign. Won't be too much longer here. Yes, not too much longer. 20, 21 days, I believe. Yeah, three weeks. Yeah. The countdown is on. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.